Well, hello everyone, my name is Scott Dorney and I'm the State Director for the North Carolina Military Business Center and I want to welcome you to this training, which is an introduction to federal contracting. We're going to jump right in and this is the agenda for today's presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about the North Carolina federal market, how the government purchases goods and services, some small business development programs that are help, available to help small businesses as they, as they compete in the federal market, some tools available from the NCMBC to help businesses compete, how you really need to get started in the market, and then some typical opportunities uh, and next steps that you need to pursue as a business. Now, a lot of folks think that maybe small businesses don't have a great opportunity in this market, but in fact, they do. The federal government sets aside 23% of all federal contracts, or targets 23% of all federal contracts to be awarded to small businesses. Now, there certainly is a system that you have to know, and it's a complicated system, but there's plenty of resources to help you understand that system and work through the red tape. And of course, every market has its own system. If you sell to the state, if you sell to your county, if you do commercial sales, or if you sell to the federal government. But the good news is that there are resources available to help you navigate this market. Well, a little bit about North Carolina and the military here in our state and federal contracting. Uh, no surprise, North Carolina is very much a military state. In fact, North Carolina has the third highest number of military personnel of any state in the United States with six major military installations. Fort Bragg, Camp Lejeune, Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point, Marine Corps Air Station New River, uh, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, and a major Coast Guard facility at Elizabeth City. We also have over 100 National Guard and Army Reserve facilities all across the state. So this is not an Eastern North Carolina phenomenon. We have military all across our state. And as you can see on the slide, about 18,000 military people transition out of the military every year just here in North Carolina. So it's great potential workforce for your business. What's the impact of this military presence here on our economy? In fact, it's huge impact on our economy. The military has a $66 billion impact on our state economy. That makes it the second largest sector of our economy, only second to agriculture and food production. In fact, the military represents about 12% of our state GDP and over a half a million jobs are associated with the military. Of course, we're most interested in contracts and business that your business can do with the federal government. So let's take a look at that next. As you can see on this slide, and actually at the bottom of this slide, federal prime contracts, those are contracts between your business and the federal government. Uh, we had over $7 billion in federal contracts awarded to businesses in North Carolina in 2019. Of that $7 billion, over $4.5 billion was with the Department of Defense. So the Department of Defense is certainly uh, the largest customer within the federal market, which is the largest customer in the world. You can also see from the chart that we have a definite growth trend in place here. Uh, not 2019 was a very good year. Those over $4 billion uh, in DOD contracts were actually executed in 80 counties within North Carolina. And if you look at all federal agencies, the $7 billion in contracts were executed in 98 of 100 North Carolina counties. And this map actually indicates where that spending happens uh, generally in our state. So dark is good. And of course, if you look at our counties with major bases, Cumberland County and Onslow County, uh, with Fort Bragg and Camp Lejeune respectively, of course, they're dark. There's a lot of contracting that happens in these counties. But you'll also notice that the Wilmington area, the Triangle area, the Triad area, the Charlotte Metro, even out west in Buncombe County and other counties in the far west and in the northeast of Pascatank County have a very heavy spending in uh, federal contracts. So this again is not an eastern North Carolina phenomenon. Federal procurement happens all across our state. In fact, most of the contracts in the eastern half of the state will tend to be services and construction and those in the western half of the state tend to be more products. So there's opportunity for businesses and manufacturers all across the state of North Carolina to sell to the federal government. So how do you get engaged? How does your business get engaged in the federal market? There are some basics that your business really needs to observe. First of all, you need to have a computer and you have to have 
preferably high-speed internet access. It's best if your firm has at least two years of commercial service and been in business for two years. You really need to have a record of good experience and good past performance, just like you would in a commercial marketplace. Remember, the federal government, just like you, likes to do business with businesses that they know and businesses that they know can successfully perform the contracts once those contracts are awarded. You definitely have to be technically and financially capable. And this market is never E-A-S-Y. That is a four letter word that we never use to describe the federal marketplace. In fact, there is a lot of competition, very few easy sales, and it is not a lifesaver for struggling businesses, but it does represent significant opportunity for your business. What should you do? First of all, do plenty of research. There's a lot of tools available to you to find out if the government buys the products or services that your business sells. One of the best sources is the Federal Procurement Data System. The FPDS will be able to tell you, and you can have Military Business Center folks help you with this, but you can learn from the FPDS system exactly what the federal government bought in any given year and who they bought it from and how much they paid for it. So it's a good way for you to determine if this market is a good fit for your business. That same data is in usaspending.gov. It's just a more friendly website that you may be able to use to access the FPDS data. Another way to determine if it's a good fit for your business is to look at federal agency websites and the federal agency procurement forecasts. So that'll be a good way to judge whether the government buys what it is that you do. It's also a good way to figure out what's going to be your best federal agency to target. DOD may be too big for your business. Maybe it's the VA, maybe it's the GSA, maybe it's the postal system, or the Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, or even the National Park Service. All those folks buy a lot of goods and services in North Carolina. By looking at their forecasts, it's a good way to determine if they're gonna buy what you do and what might be the best agencies for you to target. So now let's look at how the government buys goods and services. It's gonna be different than in the commercial market. And one thing to understand is who's who and what's what in federal acquisition. Uh, at the, the very beginning of the food chain, if you will, are the users. These are the military units or the federal agencies, the offices that need a good or service. They're the ultimate consumers. In fact, they are the clients of the contracting offices. So as a business, you will often deal with a federal contracting office whose job it is to acquire the goods and services that the users ultimately need. So the users don't have the ability to write a contract for the federal government. They go to the contracting office who puts out a federal acquisition in accordance with the federal acquisition regulations. Your company competes for it. You're given a contract, but you're actually providing a good or service to a government user. Now, as you enter the market, it's important to understand that acquiring goods and services from commercial sources from your business or other businesses through a federal contract is really at the very bottom of the prioritized sources that the government is going to use in order to provide that good or service to the ultimate user. If a user needs a good or service, goes to the contracting office, the contracting office will find out if there are other agency inventories or other agency excess that are available to meet that need. They also, in many cases, will see if the federal prison industry produces the good, normally a goods and not services, that uh, the user may ultimately need. And so it's important to know that your business may be competing not only against other businesses, but potentially against the federal prison industry that produces a lot of goods for the military and other federal agencies. And I can guarantee you, that the labor rate in the federal prison industries is far less than yours. So it's difficult to compete to sell a good or service for which the federal prison industry typically provides those goods or services to a contracting office or a federal user. Another category of prioritized sources is called Ability One. May, many of you would know this as JWAD or NIB, NISH, National Institute for the Blind or Severely Handicapped. 
They make up the Ability One system. And we have Ability One entities in North Carolina, like the Winston-Salem Industries for the Blind and many others, who provide goods and services to the federal government. So oftentimes the contracting office will look to see if a particular good or service that the customer needs, if it's ava available through the Ability One system. It's often uniforms and, and equipment items that are sewn or provided uh, through the Ability One entities. Also, there may be wholesale sources of supply like the Defense Logistics Agency, or the contracting office may use a general supply schedule, a federal supply schedule through the General Services Administration. If they do decide that they need to seek a commercial source for the good or service, it's important to know that there may be other contracts already in place that the government can utilize to acquire those goods or services. Those are often indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts. Those are contracts that are awarded to a business that any federal agency may order against. So those contracts typically have a duration of years and a ceiling value. And as long as those ceiling value has not been exceeded or the time period has not expired, a contracting office can place an order with a business that already has an IDIQ contract. Similarly, there are multiple award construction contracts, multiple award task order contracts, and single award task order contracts. Normally these are in the construction area, but they are pre-assigned contracts, short lists, if you will, of general contractors or painting contractors or roofing contractors. There's all sorts of MACs and SATOCs that the government can use to acquire a good or service instead of putting it out for a competitive acquisition. Finally, they have the ability in some cases to, to do sole source contracting. So even though it may go to a commercial business, Certain businesses in certain small business categories can receive sole source contracts, and we'll talk about that. If they exhaust all of those sources, they will put that opportunity out for a competitive acquisition. Now, how do they buy it once they decide they do need to go to commercial sources? Well, how they buy depends on the color of the money, if you will, that they're going to spend and what the value of the procurement is. There are two basic colors of money non-appropriated funds and appropriated funds. So non-appropriated funds are those funds that generally are spent by morale, welfare, and recreation activities or Marine Corps community services to support the troops. These are funds that are generally self-generated by golf courses and bowling alleys and recreation centers and other types of activities. They also receive funds from the uh, PX system or the exchange system on the basis that dedicate and donate the profits from their sales to non-appropriated fund MWR or MCCS activities. These are activities, again, for running uh, bowling alleys and golf courses and recreation centers. They can be great customers for many businesses. Let's say your business sells snack cakes or, or chips or, or drinks that you would be a great fit to uh, have placed in a pro shop at a military golf course. If you decide you want to sell your products to these activities, uh, that falls under non-appropriated funds. And there's really no requirement for your business to register as a federal contractor in the system that we'll talk about, SAM.gov, but still you should. Uh, the rules for acquisitions under non-appropriated funds are much simpler. It's very much more of a business-to-business -business transaction between your business and the non-appropriated fund contracting office. If they're going to buy a product or service under $10,000, no competition is required. They find one source at a reasonable price, they can award you the contract. As you can see, the rules, the rules change a little bit with the level of the purchase to be done. But basically, your business needs to market directly to the non-appropriated fund contracting offices, and it will be much simpler for them to buy those products from you than if they were using appropriated funds. So appropriated funds are what we normally think about. The government seeks to give businesses a fair chance to compete for contracts that are awarded using appropriated funds. And these are funds that are passed by Congress, signed into law by the president, 
appropriated to federal agencies to buy the goods and services that they need and to run their agencies and their military services. The rules for acquisitions under appropriated funds are more complicated. They're governed by the federal acquisition regulations and the supplements by each one of the departments to the federal acquisition regulations. It's important to know that under federal acquisition using appropriated funds, the government does not always have to award the lowest bidder, but often uses a best value source selection process. So, if the government's going to spend appropriated funds, again, the rules differ by the amount of money that the government is going to spend to buy goods and services. The first level is called micro-purchases. Those are up to $10,000. The buyer normally only has to find one source at a reasonable price and uses a government purchase card to make that purchase. There are many federal employees and military personnel on our bases who carry government purchase cards. So when I was a young lieutenant, we needed a product. We went to our supply sergeant, told him what we need. And about three weeks later or three months later, a product would mysteriously appear. It doesn't work that way anymore. Most units carry purchase cards and they can use those cards to buy the products and services they need from businesses right here in North Carolina or anywhere else that they find them on the internet, as long as they don't exceed the dollar limit. The next level is called Simplified Acquisition Threshold, up to $25,000. These opportunities are normally set aside for small businesses, and a small business dealer or distributor may offer products of any size manufacturer. It's not limited to a small business manufacturer. These, however, are handled by contracting officers and are assigned by commodities, and the buyer must get three quotes from vendors that they know or can locate. And that's very important because you have to make your business known to the contracting officers who are going to get these three quotes. And I'll give you an example. So my last parachute jump in the military didn't go like it was supposed to. And uh, I was out on convalescent leave for a few months, came back to my office and we had brand new carpet in our office. And I said, how did we buy the carpet? And my NCOs told me we put it on the credit card and it cost over $10,000. So what they did was inappropriate. And that was the day I met the contracting officer for Fort Bragg, who instructed me that what should have happened is that my NCO should have gone to the contracting office, said we need new carpet, it exceeds the government purchase card limit, needed the contracting officer to get three quotes from vendors that they know and locate who would then be awarded a contract to install the carpet in our office. The next level of acquisition, again, still using simplified acquisition procedures, is between $25,000 and $250,000. These acquisitions are also normally set aside for small businesses, but under a small business set aside, the dealer or distributor must sell the product of a small business manufacturer. At this level of acquisition, however, the contracting office can use a best value source selection process. Now, any opportunities for which the government anticipates the award will be over $25,000 must be publicly posted. And the place where government contracting offices post opportunities expected to exceed $25,000 is on a federal website called beta.sam.gov. And we'll talk about Beta Sam and Match Force more in a few minutes. The final level of acquisitions using appropriated funds are for purchases over $250,000. And these acquisitions are subject to federal small business programs. Past performance will definitely be a factor. These proposals will normally require not a simple quote, but may require a technical proposal and a cost proposal. And it's a much more formal process. And the key here is to follow the instructions in the RFQ or the request for proposal when you're submitting a proposal on these acquisitions. So we've mentioned uh, some of these small business federal contracting programs. So let's look at those just a little bit more. You know, I had a contracting officer tell me one time, or in fact, ask a large group, what is the purpose of federal contracting or military contracting? And of course, most people said the purpose is to get the goods and services that the users the soldiers, the Marines, or the airmen, or the Coast Guardsmen may need. Well, that's only half the story. 
The purpose of federal government acquisitions is not only to get the goods and services that the soldier needs, but to meet and exceed national policy goals. And those include doing business with small businesses. And it's very good for businesses, the small businesses, to compete because often they'll only be competing against like businesses, may receive price preferences, and you're actually helping the government meet its small business goals. So what are those goals? We mentioned in the beginning that the federal government has a goal of doing 23% of all federal contracting with small businesses. In fact, there are also subcategories of small businesses with their own goals. And we'll talk about each one of these, and you can see the numerical goals for each one of the programs. But the first question that we often get asked is, is my business a small business? And the rule for small business in the federal government may differ from any state or your interpretation of what a small business may be. To be classified as a small business concern, a business, first of all, has to be for profit. So a nonprofit is not a small business. It must be independently operated. It has to be located in the United States. It cannot be nationally dominant, but I can't think of too many small businesses that are nationally dominant. And it must meet an SBA size standard for small. And what are those standards? Well, they vary by what the business does. So when we get asked the question, are we a small business? The answer is, it depends on what you do. If you're a manufacturer, more than likely, uh, it's going to be based on the number of employees that you have. If you're under 500 employees, generally, and you're a manufacturer, you're going to be a small business. If you provide a service, you're not a manufacturer, it'll be based on the average annual receipts of the company over the three complete most recent fiscal years, or five years, optional up to 2022, whichever is more um, beneficial to the business. Now, it is important to know that in doing the determination that you have to include any parent or affiliated companies in counting your average annual receipts and employees. And it's also important to know that a firm could be a small business for one product or service that they provide and large for others. In fact, I remember a few years ago, it was a bit controversial that Walmart was actually considered a small business. I believe it was for banking. You know, they started their own banks inside the store. But that, when it was a new enterprise, they were a small business when it came to banking. And not most, most of us would not consider Walmart otherwise to be a small business. So we give you a link to the size standards. And the SBA will be able to tell you, based on what your business does, that is, based on your NAICS code, what the standard is to determine if your business is a small business. And all of these links are integrated into the slides, which you have access to, and you can click on these links at your leisure and determine from each one of those links if your business, first of all, uh, is a small business, but also if it could potentially qualify for other small business programs. So what are those programs? The first one is the SBA's Hub Zone program. Now this is often confused with the state hub program, but actually the programs are quite different. A hub zone is a census tract that's designated as a hub zone based on a median income that's below a certain standard or an unemployment rate that's above a certain standard. After every census, and that's why our census is so important right now, a census tract is determined whether it does or does not qualify as a hub zone. If a business is located in a hub zone, it's 51% U.S. owned with the principal office and 35% of its employees living in a hub zone, does not have to be the same hub zone that the business is in, then they can apply for SBA certification. If they are certified as an SBA hub zone business, they are eligible for sole source contracts, can receive set-asides and be able to compete for contracts that are set aside only for hub zone businesses, and they can get a price preference in full and open competitions. And you can see on the slide that I have an example of an opportunity that's actually set aside for hub zone program participants. This is the SBA website. If you follow that link, it'll take you directly and to this website, and you can determine 
further if your business might qualify as a hub zone. And really all you need to do is put the address of your business into the SBA's map and it'll tell you whether you are or are not located in a hub zone. And those hub zones often change after the different census. And it can come down to which side of a street your business is located on. So it is very important to carefully locate your business or put your address in to get an actual determination of whether or not your business is located in a hub zone. The second category of small businesses is the Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business Program. To qualify as a Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business, that first of all, the business must be a small business concern. It has to be at least 51% owned and controlled and actively operated by service disabled veterans. The owner or owners of the business need to have a disability rating letter from the VA. Now that can be a 0% compensable disability rating, but they must have a service connected disability and a disability rating letter from the VA. This is actually a self certification. So when you register your business in SAM, if you qualify as an SDVOSB, as we call them, you can self-designate yourself, your business, as an SDVOSB small business. However, we encourage you to go and become VA verified under the Veterans First Contracting Program that's run by the VA. This will make your business eligible to compete for sole source contracts and set-asides from the VA that are set aside just for a service disabled veteran owned small business. And we do have an example of one for roof inspection services that is set aside for SDVOSBs. And again, this is the SBA website. It's very important to know that to be SBA certified, you can self certify as an SDVOSB, but it is a good idea and strongly recommended that you also become VA verified. And this is the VA website uh, that you'll go to to initiate your uh, Vets First verification program for your business. The third category of small businesses that you may qualify for is what we call the Small Disadvantage Business or the 8A Business Development Program. In order to be designated as a Small Disadvantage Business or an 8A Program participant, your business needs to be 51% owned and actively controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. And there is a very careful definition for what this is. A socially disadvantaged business includes any business that's owned by folks of a minority group, but others may, may qualify as well if they can justify. They also have to have a net worth that is below a certain threshold uh, in order to qualify as a uh, small disadvantaged business. This program does require SBA certification, so your business will apply for 8A designation. The 8A program does allow for award of sole source contracts as well as having contracts set aside for competition only among other 8A businesses. You can see we have an example of a Fort Bragg Refuse and Recycle Services contract, which was set aside for an 8A, won by a fine 8A in Georgia, who has moved his business to North Carolina and set up an office in Spring Lake, North Carolina. Again, this is the SBA website on the 8A Business Development Program. This is probably uh, the best program if your business qualifies that you will want to participate in. It's a nine-year program. There's great training available to 8A qualified businesses. So it's not just a matter of getting uh, federal contracts. It's a great way to grow your business. Then we come to the women-owned small business program. Uh, and being a woman-owned uh, small business program requires that a business is, first of all, 51% owned and controlled by one woman or multiple women. But there are also additional requirements if you want your business to qualify as an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. Now it is very important to know that the certification requirements for WOSBs changed significantly in July of 2020. You can still self-certify 
your business as a woman-owned small business and compete for contracts and you will help that federal agency if they award that contract to you to help meet their women-owned small business goal. However, 444 NAICS codes or categories of businesses were set aside for women-owned small businesses that are certified WOSB, certified by the SBA. And there's an additional 80 NAICS codes types of business contracts that are set aside for economically disadvantaged women-owned small businesses. So although you can self-certify as a WOSB, it definitely is worth your time and effort to become SBA certified as a WOSB so that you can compete for contracts within those 444 industry sectors or ADEW, EDWOSB industry sectors if you qualify. This uh, is the SBA website. You can learn all about the Women Owned Small Business Program. Also our PTAC and our North Carolina Military Business Center can help walk you through these different programs. And before we leave the small business programs, I just want to mention that, we, because I've referred several times to helping meet federal goals for small businesses, but it's also important to know that the federal government passes those small business goals down to major prime contractors. So not only will these qualifications help you win federal prime contracts, but it makes your business attractive to other prime contractors who have a small business utilization goal to utilize hub zone businesses, to utilize women owned small businesses or small disadvantaged businesses. So we have many businesses that say, I don't like preference programs. I don't want to, I don't want, I want to compete on a level playing field. Well, actually you are, because believe me, you'll be competing against many other small businesses who also have those certifications, but you're actually helping the federal government and you're helping prime contractors to meet their goals. So it would behoove your business to certify or self-certify in as many of those programs for which you qualify. I do wanna mention the All Small Mentor Protege Program. Uh, there have been mentor protege programs around from federal agencies, including the SBA, DOD, and others for quite some time. Those have often been set aside for certain types of businesses like small disadvantaged businesses. However, the SBA has instituted an all small mentor protege program. So now any business can, just about every, any business can enter into a mentor protege relationship, either as a mentor or as a protege. And there are advantages to both of the parties within those uh, mentor protege program relationships, including the ability to establish a joint venture which can compete for contracts as an independent entity. If your business qualifies, you might also look at the Natural Resources Sales Program. If your business can sell lumber, forestry products, mining products, that sort of thing. So these are the SBA websites for the All Small Men and Protege Program and the Natural Resource Sales Assistance Program. So please check those out. Get with your local PTAC or the Military Business Center and we can certainly help you with those. Again, uh, let's talk about subcontracting. It's important to understand that federal subcontracts are really commercial contracts between your business and a prime contractor. As I indicated earlier, oftentimes prime contractors have small business utilization goals and are often required to submit a subcontracting plan when they're awarded a contract. They do have goals for different types of small businesses, and this really could be a good way for your business to get started in the federal market. Nothing wrong with being a prime contractor, but we've discovered that the subcontracting dollars are just as green as the prime contracting dollars. So it's a good way to get your past performance, your experience in the federal market that you can utilize later on to compete as a prime contractor. So those are the, a lot of these small business programs, an overview of the market. What are some tools that are available to help you get started in the market? I've already mentioned the North Carolina Procurement Technical Assistance Center, and most states have a PTAC. 
They will help your business understand small business programs, get registered, get certified, get started in the federal market. The Military Business Center can assist you with that as well, although our focus is slightly different. Although the PTAC and the Military Business Center are trying to achieve the same goal of growing the defense economy in North Carolina, we do it in different ways. The Military Business Center is a business development and tech transition asset of the community college system. It's totally state funded. Our services are offered fee free to businesses in North Carolina for the purpose of growing our defense economy. Our mission is to leverage military and federal business opportunities in order to expand the economy, grow jobs and improve quality of life in North Carolina. And we were assigned several goals by our General Assembly, the chief one being to increase federal revenues for businesses through federal contracts. And I often go to the General Assembly and I'm often asked how many contracts has the Military Business Center been awarded so far this year? And the answer is always the same, it's none. We have the privilege of working with and providing technical support to great businesses in North Carolina who have won over 3,400 contracts, brought over $13 billion of revenue into our state, and created hundreds or thousands of jobs to execute those federal contracts. The Military Business Center provides a wide range of services from future opportunity, market intelligence, pre-positioning, and teaming your businesses with prime contractors, current opportunities, connecting them to your businesses, helping you understand that federal solicitation, reviewing your proposal, helping you develop subcontractors or being a subcontractor. We also provide training and counseling and some assistance to help you successfully execute that contract as well. The Military Business Center is a business development organization. We do business development like your business does. We bring businesses to the federal marketplace. We recruit them, we engage them, we help them get registered as contractors. We pre-position them for future opportunities and subcontract opportunities. Our primary operation though is connecting your business with opportunities, whether prime or sub, helping you understand those opportunities and helping you submit winning proposals or quotes so that your business can win either that federal prime or subcontract. The Military Business Center has offices all across the state of North Carolina represented by those STARS, which are either full-time or part-time offices. If you go to the NCMBC website, contact us page, you'll find contact information for every member of our team. Every day, the Military Business Center, uh, our business development team, uh, issues contract opportunities that have been reviewed, verified, validated, look winnable, look lucrative, we send those into our headquarters and our headquarters sends out a message to your business identifying those contract opportunities for which we think your business can compete. The second way that we connect opportunities to businesses is through Matchforce. So if we doubled the number of business developers we had across the state, we could not see every federal contract every day. But Matchforce.org does see every contract every day. Matchforce matches businesses in North Carolina to federal opportunities. It'll match you to future opportunities that we load into the system. Businesses can even post business to business opportunities for teaming partners and subcontractors. Matchforce is provided free to businesses in North Carolina and nearly 23,000 businesses in our state have registered in and utilize Matchforce every day. Matchforce works like a dating service. You create a profile in Matchforce, an opportunity enters Matchforce at night. At two o'clock in the morning, it brings in every federal contract opportunity into the system and it matches federal contract opportunities to your business and will send your business just one email every morning if there's a federal contract that matches what your business does. This is what Matchforce looks like. And again, all you need to do is to complete a free registration. And our tech support for Matchforce is located right here at North Carolina, should you need assistance. Again, uh, the Military Business Center also provides tech transition services. So if your business is developing new technology that might have a defense or federal application, the North Carolina Deaf Tech Office can help you navigate federal agencies and help you introduce 
that technology to federal agencies, military commands, or other folks that might utilize your technology. Our website, you've already been on it to locate this training or register for North Carolina Military Business Center events, but there are a lot of resources on this website. Please sit down with an NCMBC business development professional. Let them help you navigate this and find lots of resources to help you compete in the federal market. We also uh, offer many statewide events. Those occur throughout the year. They're in principally industries for which we have a strategic focus, including defense textiles, medical, biomedical, biodefense, uh, aerospace, cybersecurity, and federal construction. Our federal construction summit every year in Wilmington generally attracts about 850 contractors and over 100 federal contracting officials. So each one of these events is designed to connect businesses in North Carolina with federal contracting offices that buy the goods and services that your business produces. All right, so let's talk about how to get your business started in this market. You certainly realized at this point that there's plenty of opportunity for businesses in the state of North Carolina, that there are small business programs that your business can take advantage of, and that we have the best infrastructure in the country. We have a wonderful procurement technical assistance center, small business centers in our community colleges, the best universities in the community colleges that can help your business get started and be successful through our small business technology development center. And we also have the only military business center in the country to provide business development services to help connect you with federal opportunities and help you compete and win. So let's talk about how you're gonna get started in this market. First of all, if your business sells goods or services, remembering back to the credit card capacity of $10,000, you know, there's about $70 million a year in credit card activity on Fort Bragg alone. So you can anticipate that it's pretty much about the same at Camp Lejeune and well over $100 million in credit card activity that happens at our military installations just here in North Carolina alone. So certainly you can compete successfully at the credit card level. All that you really need to do is to be able to accept credit cards. You should be registered in Matchforce. You should have a good web profile. You should take, take part in trade shows, advertise locally, come to events. Make sure that contracting officers and credit card holders know how to find you in order to buy the goods and services that your business offers. But if you want to get involved beyond the credit card level, that is above $10,000, the good news is we have a checklist to help you uh, get started in the market and to be a guide. And this checklist is under the resource tab of the NCMBC website. This is only one portion of it. The checklist is about four pages long, but don't let that dissuade you because many parts of the checklist won't apply to your company. And it's best to use the checklist online because many of the links that will take you to the sites on which you need to register are hot links and they'll take you directly if you work off of the checklist that's available online. So basically, uh, getting started in the market, the first thing that I would do if I were you is register in Matchforce. Because although there are other steps that you have to complete in order to be awarded a federal contract, we don't want you to miss that opportunity today that your business could compete for. So the first thing I would like you to do is register your business for free in matchforce.org. Then you're gonna to need to complete some other steps, including identifying what your business does, identifying your products and services, determine if your firm qualifies for many of these small business programs, and finally to register as a government contractor in sam.gov, and we'll talk about each one of these steps individually. So when we talk about identifying your business and your capabilities, it's important to understand that we're talking about identifying your business capabilities in government speak. It's very important that you be able to sit down with a contracting officer or sit down with a user and be able to explain to that military person or that federal agency what your business does in a language that they understand. So you'll want to develop a capability sheet on which you identify your employer ID number, your EIN or your TIN that you obtain 
from the IRS. You're going to get a Dun & Bradstreet number, which is free for federal vendors. You're going to also identify the NAICS codes. That's the North American Industry Classification System code that applies to your business, to the products and services that your business provides. In other words, uh, there is a code that applies to every type of business in America. And in fact, this is one of the few good things that came out of NAFTA, was the NAICS system that is used to identify what businesses do. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that as you look at the NAICS code, and these are actually run by the Census Bureau, and you can look them up on the Census website. It's a very easy website to use. You'll see that for your product, there will be a separate NAICS code for a wholesaler, a dealer, a distributor, a manufacturer, or a retailer. And it's very important to understand that the government, when buying a product, will always list the NAICS code in the opportunity for the manufacturer. So even if you're a wholesaler, dealer, distributor, or reseller, you will want to include the NAICS code of the manufacturer in your business profile. And again, you can look these up on the Census website. You also have to be able to identify your products and services by federal supply code or product service codes. And you can see we have a link here for you to look up the products and services that your business provides and be able to identify the PSC codes that apply to your business and you'll want to include those on your capability statement. The next thing is to determine, first of all, if your business is a small business, which again, the definition of a small business, it depends on your NAICS code and depends on what your business does. And you can be small for one NAICS code and not small for others. Again, remember you must include the parent or affiliated companies in determining whether your business is a small business concern, okay? And again, there's a link to the SBA Table of Small Business Size Standards, which is by NAICS code. You'll look up your NAICS code and it will tell you what the standard is to determine whether your business is a small business either based on the number of employees or on the average annual receipts of your business. Probably the most important step in becoming a federal contractor is to register in the System for Award Management, or SAM.gov. SAM.gov is an official free website of the United States government. Now, why do I mention that? Because if you go to Google and you Google SAM.gov, the first few actual returns that you will get will more than likely be consultants that are available to help you register in SAM.gov. Registering in SAM.gov is simple, it's free, it does take time, don't start at 11.45 and plan on going to lunch at noontime. But registering in SAM is mandatory before you can be awarded a federal contract. Okay? It is going to ask you for a lot of information about your business, including your finances and your banking information, but some businesses say they don't want to give that information, they don't want to register because they don't want the government to know that about them. Believe me, they already know that about you. So please take this step, register in SAM so you can be awarded a federal contract. By the way, that banking information allows them to pay you electronically and pay you very quickly. So many folks don't want to get in a federal market because they think it's slow, the federal government doesn't pay quickly. In fact, all invoicing is done electronically and you will be paid very quickly as long as you have a good SAM profile and the banking information that you include is accurate. You will also be asked to complete the SBA supplemental pages and this allows data to be, that you enter to be transferred to the SBA's Dynamic Small Business Search, or DSBS database. And this is very important. Many businesses don't take that extra step. And I can tell you that contracting officers will look up your business on the DSBS database or on SAM. And you might remember a football coach a few years ago Bill Parcells said, your team is what your record says you are. 
Well, that applies in federal contracting as well. Your business is what your SAM profile or your DSBS profile says you are. So it's inherent and very important uh, for your business to have an excellent SAM profile and one that you keep up, uh, keep accurate at all times. Registering SAM will result in your being awarded a cage code and you want to include your cage code as long as you, along with your NAICS codes and your PSC codes in your capability statement. This is what SAM looks like. You can go to this site to register your business and also you can search uh, the profiles of other businesses if you want to see the capabilities of other businesses that have registered as federal contractors. All right, so we're on our final step. So now you are well aware of the opportunities in the federal market. You're aware of the small business programs that are available to help your business be successful. You understand some of the tools and services that are available through the Military Business Center, the NCP TAC, and others, and you're ready to get started in the federal market. You've registered in SAM, you've registered in Matchforce, and now you're ready to receive opportunities uh, for your business. So, every morning at five o'clock in the morning, if there is a federal contract that matches what you do, and if you have a profile in Matchforce, you will receive one email from Matchforce about five o'clock every morning. Also, if an opportunity that the Military Business Center business development professionals have reviewed, validated, and determined is a lucrative and winnable contract, you may receive that opportunity from the NCMBC headquarters as well. What do you do when you get that message? When you get the message from Matchforce that you have an opportunity that matches what you do, the most important thing is to open the message and see what the opportunities are. Uh, that have been matched to your business. And you're going to see uh, that it will take you directly to beta.sam.gov so you can review those opportunities. And you may have one opportunity, three opportunities. If you have more than three, you'll want to log on to Matchforce to look at the contracts that you have matched to your business. But if it's three or less, they'll be directly on the email that you'll receive about five o'clock in the morning. Once you click on the link that's in that email, it'll take you to beta.sam.gov, and the first type of opportunity that you will see is called a Sources Sought Notice. It is a, exactly what it says it is. The Federal Contracting Office uses a Sources Sought Notice to do market research to find out what businesses or what types of businesses within small business categories are available to provide the products or services that the contracting office needs. In this case, you can see that this is a source of sought notice for uh, water for the um, ocean terminal at Sunny Point here in North Carolina. And this opportunity, if you click on that link and scan down the opportunity, you will see that like any opportunity, it has a header that tells you the contracting uh, agency where this contract came from. In this case, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Army, the Army Materiel Command, the Army Contracting Command, and ultimately Rock Island Arsenal uh, Joint Munitions Command. And the opportunity is for portable water, potable water services at the Marine Ocean Terminal in Sunny Point. Every notice will include a general information area that tells you what the type of notice is, in this case, a source is sought notice, when the notice was published, when any responses do, which could be from two days, three days, or a week, or even more, the different type of classification, what the product service code is, that PSC code, what that describes the type of product or service that the government is looking for. The NAICS code, describes the type of business that the government anticipates will be providing this good or service and will receive the contract. And it tells you what the place of performance is. In this case, the Military Ocean Terminal at Sunny Point, North Carolina. It will then describe the opportunity. Again, this is the sources sought notice, and they want you to respond. And it's very important that businesses respond to these sources sought notices. 
Then I'll tell you, this is the reason why, because this is the one type of notice that you can respond to that you have the opportunity to influence the acquisition process. So the government is asking what resources are out there, what types of businesses are available to provide this service. They'll tell you how to respond and when to respond and where to respond. And if you have any questions, you can contact the contracting office and they provide a point of contact with phone number and email address. They'll also give the history of the opportunity. In this case, as it's an original source of sought message, but this could turn into a pre-solicitation or a solicitation, ultimately a federal contract award. The second type of notice that you'll see is called a pre-solicitation. A pre-solicitation is exactly what it says that it is. The government is giving you a warning that it intends to put out a solicitation in the future for a particular product or service. The pre-solicitation tells you when and where the solicitation will be posted. It also provides a button at the top of the opportunity, which we'll look at, for you to follow that opportunity. And it's very important if you are interested in competing for this opportunity that you do click on follow the opportunity. Because when you click on, when you do that and you become a, an interested vendor, the government will automatically send you any updates to this opportunity. So as you can see, this is an opportunity from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service in Cherokee County, North Carolina, which has a need for janitorial services and garbage pickup at several different recreation sites. Now, not all titles are this long, thankfully, but you'll see all different types of titles to these opportunities. Again, like the sources sought notice, this pre-solicitation tells you where the opportunity is coming from. In this case, the Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, and the office is the National Forest Service Office for North Carolina. The general information area will tell you that this is a pre-solicitation notice. It was issued on the 7th of July. The response date is the 20th of July. In the body of the message, well, in the classification area, it will again will tell you whether this is set aside for any particular type of businesses. In this case, the opportunity will be set aside for small businesses, not any particular subcategory, but a total small business set aside. They provide the product service code and the NAICS code for the type of business that they anticipate will be executing this contract and tell you that the place of performance is in Murphy, North Carolina. Any pre-solicitation notice in the body will tell you where the solicitation will ultimately be posted. So remember that the pre-solicitation is a warning order. It's telling you that the government will be issuing a solicitation for a product or service. In the body of the message, it will tell you where and when the solicitation will be posted. And it's not always on beta.sam.gov. So it's important that you look and find out where the solicitation will ultimately be posted uh, so that you can follow that opportunity and respond to that solicitation when it does come out. The next type of opportunity notice that you might see is for what's called a combined synopsis and solicitation. These are absolutely my favorite because these are the simplest uh, messages or opportunities to respond to. Basically, the government intends to acquire commercial items for supplies or services. They're going to issue one notice called a synopsis and solicitation. There will not be a separate solicitation notice issued. They're going to provide within this one notice, in this case for aircraft disinfectant, they're going to provide all of the information that a business needs to successfully compete or submit a proposal for this uh, opportunity. As you can see, this opportunity was issued by the Department of Defense. It actually came from the National Guard Bureau, and in fact, the office is the North Carolina Army National Guard. Again, you can see the type of opportunity, in this case, a combined synopsis or solicitation. You see the published date and the response date. You can see that this is a total small business set aside 
for businesses with product service code of 79 and a NAICS code, in this case, of 325612. You can see where the, uh, or how to respond to this, and in this case, this will be done as a reverse auction which is sometimes done by the government when they're buying commercial items. So you will actually log on to a reverse auction site and there will be a live reverse auction where you will compete against other businesses and offer your best price to the government to provide these goods or services. All right, the next type of opportunity that you're going to see is a sole source opportunity. Now. Hopefully, if there's a sole source opportunity, it has your name on it and the government's decided to sole source from you. But that isn't always the case. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're totally out of luck and that you cannot respond to a sole source opportunity. But you'll have to decide whether it's worth the time to do that. What the government is doing is announcing a non-competitive uh, procurement. They are allowing a single business or supplier who meets the requirements to respond to this. However, they're also posting it so that if you or another business owner thinks that you offer a better product or service to meet the needs of the contracting office or the user, you can challenge the sole source notice, okay? So you may see sole source notices that come out in different formats. Some of them are gonna be special notices. Some are gonna be just sole source notices. In this case, you can see that the Department of the Interior, U.S. Geological Survey, the Office of Acquisition and Grants intends to, through a special notice in this case, uh, issue a sole source contract. And the description paragraph will tell you exactly what the service is that they're anticipating awarding and the company to whom they anticipate making that contract award. It is certainly an opportunity for you if you can provide that good or service, you certainly can challenge that sole source and uh, the government would appreciate knowing about other opportunities. However, it is important to know that they probably have done market research and identified that that company for, to which they intend to issue the sole source may have a unique one. One that I saw not too long ago was the government wanted to have recruiting posters at Cross Creek Mall in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Well, unless you're the Cross Creek Mall in Fayetteville, North Carolina, you're not gonna be able to provide that good or service to the government. When you get that message in the morning from Match Force or from the Military Business Center, uh, you may click on that opportunity and find out that the type of notice that you're looking at is a solicitation notice. As we talked about when we discussed pre-solicitations, the list solicitation is the actual intent to purchase by the government. The solicitation notice does ensure that all qualified businesses have an opportunity to compete. And as you read through the solicitation notice, and we won't go to this particular example, but I encourage you to do so when you have the slides, tells you exactly how to prepare the solicitation, what the planned procurement will be for, what any amendments that may have been issued to the solicitation, it's a means of receiving offers from businesses. So it is the actual opportunity solicited by the government to purchase the goods or services. And normally, if it, they will use a solicitation if it's a higher buy, a bigger buy than they can accomplish through a combined synopsis and solicitation that we looked at previously. Another notice that you'll frequently see is a modification or amendment. And this notice is exactly what it is, uh, is, what it sounds like. The government is telling you that about any additions to or deletions from corrections or modifications to an existing solicitation or pre-solicitation that's already out on the street, okay? It's very important that you monitor modifications and amendments for any opportunity for which you intend to submit a proposal. In fact, you'll often be required to acknowledge your receipt of modifications and amendments when you submit your proposal uh, for that contract. So you can accomplish being uh, absolutely certain that you've gotten all the modifications and amendments by following that opportunity. Remember when we opened the opportunity, at the very top there's a button for follow, and you can see that on any one of these examples, 
You always want to follow the opportunity so that you automatically receive any modifications, amendments, or additional notices about that solicitation, including an award notice, which hopefully will be to you. Another type of notice that you'll see uh, potentially when you get that match force message and you open up is a special notice. So the government may use a special notice to announce changes to an acquisition. They often use them to announce industry days or events or special activities or the intent to sole source. And you'll remember that the sole source notice that we looked at earlier was actually in the form of a special notice. We won't open this opportunity, but certainly feel free to look at it. And if you have any questions about a special notice, bring those up to us at the Military Business Center. We can explain that to you. The final uh, type of notice that you'll receive is an award notice. And this is exactly what it is. So when you follow the opportunity, you will receive every modification, every amendment. You'll ultimately receive the solicitation. After you submit your proposal, hopefully you'll be notified by the government that you won that contract. If you're not awarded that contract, you will receive the award notice along with every other interested vendor. You can open up the opportunity when you get it and you can see what company was awarded that contract, for how much money, when it's going to be performed, and where it's going to be performed. Okay, so those are the different types of opportunities that you're gonna receive, and again, the Military Business Center, the PTAC, is always available to help you go through this more slowly, more deliberately. But we wanted you to be exposed to the different types of opportunities that you're going to see, because we want you to know how to respond. We want you to be able to compete and to be awarded those federal contracts. So what are your next steps? What do you need to do right now? First thing is to be sure that you're web enabled to be able to find contracts and to learn the basic rules of contracting as we've talked about them today. So you're certainly not going to become a contracting officer, but you need to understand the basic rules about how the government competes and awards federal contracts. You need to learn how to describe your business and your products or services in government speak. Know your DUNS code, your NAICS codes, your CAGE codes, and the federal supply codes and product service codes that apply to the products and services that you sell. You certainly want to develop good marketing materials and a capability statement so that when you meet with government contracting officers or small business specialists, you're able to speak the government speak and explain to those individuals why your business is the perfect business to provide the goods or services that they need for their clients, the actual users of the goods and services. Again, we have a wonderful checklist on ncmbc.us under the resource tab, and we certainly want you to register on Matchforce and register in SAM so that you can be awarded that government contract. The next thing that you need to do is be sure to certify with the SBA if you qualify as a hub zone business, an 8A small disadvantaged business, or a service disabled veteran owned small business through vetbiz.gov. You want to monitor opportunities through beta.sam or through Matchforce. You want to respond to opportunities. Remember, responding to those sources sought notices is your one opportunity to tell the government contracting office why they should buy what they need from businesses like yours. Then you want to be sure to network with prime contractors for subcontracting opportunities. So whether you're not ready for a prime contract or if the goods and services that you provide are normally utilized by prime contractors to execute contracts that they've been awarded, for example, in construction. Uh, yes, you can provide construction materials directly to the government but much more often, you're gonna provide those to prime contractors. So take advantage of networking opportunities, leverage resources that are provided to you, join networking connecting organizations like the Defense Alliance of North Carolina, use the North Carolina Military Business Center, their Procurement Technical Assistance Center, the SBA, the small business centers at your community colleges, and attend events that bring together the federal contracting officers and businesses like yours in order to make your business known to the federal government to help you build those relationships, 
educate contractors on what you can do so your business can successfully propose on and be awarded federal contracts. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, and it certainly uh, may, be, uh, may be too much for one day to understand, and you may want to look at this uh, video multiple times. You certainly want to contact the Military Business Center so our business development professionals can work with you one-on-one -on -one to go through this material and help you set up your business to compete successfully as a federal contractor. Please feel free to contact me at any time. Contact Mark Mills, who runs our business development team. He's our business development manager at Catawba Valley Community College. Contact your business development team professional statewide, simply by looking them up in the Contact Us page of our website. Contact the one that's closest to your location. Set up a counseling opportunity and meet with that business development professional so that you fully understand your opportunities and how to compete in the federal market. We do want you to register on MatchForce, and if you need technical assistance in completing that registration, please contact Tim Malone, who provides technical assistance uh, to all MatchForce users as our MatchForce manager. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in this training today. We in the Military Business Center look forward to working with you. More importantly, we look forward to you winning contracts and helping us grow the defense economy in North Carolina. Thank you very much.